Bless us now as we preach this word in Jesus' name, amen. The perturbation of Christ. The event was the 99th Holy Convocation of the Church of God in Christ. The city was the city of Memphis. State of Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee is the headquarters of the church of God in Christ. The bishop at the time, the presiding bishop, was the late great G.E. Patterson. The year was 2006, 13 years ago. Yours truly stood during the day session and preached a message entitled, Jesus is Still Angry. I preached that message from the same text that I am preaching from today. I was not led of the Lord to preach that message again, nor have I preached from this text since that time. Nor have I watched the video or the DVD of that service. It's hard for me to watch myself. I haven't watched the video or the DVD from the convocation in uh, last this past convocation in November. The Lord moved, and my, mo my mother asked me yesterday, she said, sons, have you not watched it yet? I said, no, Mom, but, but I will. And I think I want to be able to tell her yes, so that kind of changes it. Um, you know, some people are just the opposite. They're narcissists. They're in love with their own image. Amen. People have their own picture on their smartphone. I mean, come on, man. I mean, phone ring, light up. It's the, the pictures of them. Not their mother, not their spouse, not their children, not Spot, the dog, not Lassie. Them. There's something wrong with that. You, you decide to get a tattoo, even though the Bible says you shouldn't do it. And if you have them, and you got them before you met the Lord, you know, that's all right, but don't add any more. But I'm always amazed at people who tattoo their own names on their bodies. You don't know your name? There's something kind of narcissistic about that. In big letters, your name. So I, I haven't watched the, the, uh, the event. Every time I went to get a copy, to God be the glory, of that event in 2006, the tapes were sold out. I, I couldn't even get a complimentary copy of the message I preached <laughs> that year. To God be the glory, Every time that I've been blessed to preach in, on a national level, the CDs, they sell out. They stay on back order because people love the gospel. Some of the big names they bring in, the famous people, they have to put their tapes on sale, cut them down to almost giveaway prices, and then beg people to buy them. Then the little local preacher get up and just preach the Bible. Book, chapter, and verse. And you can't keep them in stock. I'm glad that our church still loves the word of God. Amen. 
She just walked in, but to God be the glory, Sister Dot Bellinger, Bellinger, wave your hands, Sister Bellinger. She secured a copy of that message for me. And she got it from Bound to for Blessings Incorporated. And I have it on my desk. Thank you, uh, Sister Bellinger. It is amazing how current and how up-to-date the Bible is. As I have said for many years, and I continue to say that the Bible is more current than tomorrow morning's newspaper. The Bible has not changed, even though it seems as though um, they're trying to change it. The warning have gone out that um, I think it's HarperCollins have bought out Zandervan. And HarperCollins and Zandervan are now changing the NIV Bible, taking scriptures out of it. And when I heard this, I said, well, there I go again, being a correct prophet. Who told you at least two or three years ago, be careful of uh, you, having your Bible on your iPhones and on your devices and not owning your own Bibles? I told you, they will change, see, that, that information. Amen. Amen. They can't change this. So I bought this. See, I own this. And, uh, I, and by the way, don't ask me, I don't lend out my Bibles. Because mm -mm. these, this is, this is, these are bullets in my gun. You have to buy your own. Amen. You have to go to where they sell them. And, and, I, and I recommend, you know, if you have the Bible online, you go to your devices, that's fine. But don't sell them with that. They're changing them. Get, get, buy Bibles. Amen. You can afford them. You got shoes everywhere. Most people only wear 5 to 10% of their clothing. Most of the other stuff just hang up there. Time get it. The moth get it. And some of the things, folk grow out of it. But they won't give it away. Say, One of these days I'm going to get back in it. And that day never comes. The Bible says this, Proverbs 23, buy the truth, sell it not. The Bible has not changed. God's truth has not changed, nor will it ever change. Sad to say that the conditions that cause our Lord to be perturbed that existed in the New Testament period at the time when Mark recorded this, that existed in 2006 when the Lord had me to preach this message or one similar to it. Those conditions still exist today and are even multiplied. It is the hardness of heart yes, sir. that manifests itself through indifference in the ruling religious class. The Bible speaks of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Isn't it amazing that the truth can be held hostage? It has often been said that in a cultural war, the first casualty in a cultural war is truth. The notion that there is such a thing as overarching truth. Those who have been following this ministry, you've heard me talk about this ad nauseum. And I will always talk about it because uh, you need to, to get this. 
There is such a thing as overarching truth. It is truth that is truth all the time. Amen. It cannot be altered. We hear today as it was introduced uh, in, by media through people like Oprah and other talk shows, people now, and you even hear Christians from time to time uh, relate to it, uh, say, well, I got to tell my truth. And, and I'm, tell, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna speak my truth and you tell your truth and you tell your truth. No, 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 that's not 50 different truths. Amen. Your story may be true, it may be accurate, but there is such a thing as truth. Truth by definition, the Greek word is uh, uh, aletheia. It is the underlining reality which lies at the base of a thing. When you peel back the onions and get to the base of a thing, when you can peel back no further, that's truth. Jesus said this about the Bible, in John's Gospel, chapter 17. Sanctify them through thy, through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The Bible is truth. It's God's truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus said, God is a spirit. And they that worship God must worship him in spirit, in attitude, and in truth, in reality. People say, we've got to keep it real. Well, keeping it real is that Jesus changes people. I'm amazed at the number of preachers who curse or who swear or the number of church folk who behave unseemly and then they say, well, I'm just trying to keep it real. Well, whose reality are you talking about? The reality is that God is a keeper. Yes, he is. He's a keeper. So we're living in a day where many Religious leaders are indifferent. It is a deafening silence. The deafening silence of the presbytery. It is a conspiracy of silence amongst those who claim to speak for God. Isn't it amazing the number of of preachers, the number of bishops, the number of leaders who are silent on issues that matter. It is those religious leaders who preach fluff and who invite fluff preachers to preach to their congregants who have mastered the art of saying nothing well, who have, as we will see in our text, violated every tenet of their faith and have teamed up with their own enemies, the Herodian party, to seek counsel on how they might work to destroy Jesus and those who truly speak on his behalf, those who preach according to the scriptures. There are people, religious leaders, who oppose the gospel preacher. It perturbed Jesus then, it perturbs Jesus now. Jesus is still angry. Let's look at our text on this Father's Day. I don't know if this is a Father's Day message or not. But I want you to hear me just for a few minutes and hopefully we'll go home. My wife was preparing a feast for me today. Oh, my. 
And, and then I saw where somebody else dropped off a blessing. So, treadmill, here I come. Because I'm going to need it. Amen. I enjoy eating. I enjoy, I enjoy life. I enjoy living. I don't eat with people I don't like. I like to be able to enjoy a meal. See, you sit down, you like to have good conversation. And you ever, you ever tried to eat and you're uptight? Oh, you have heartburn for the next six months. And every time you taste that meal after that, you're reminded of that person or that thing. So no, I love to sit down and eat and eat in peace. And, and me and John Jr. fight it out. Amen. But in our text, Jesus enters, verse, chapter 3, verse 1. It says, and he entered into the synagogue the Jewish house of worship. Jesus had not yet established the church. And there was a man there. The first thing we see is that Jesus, and he's the son of God, he never needed salvation, he never sinned, he never fell short, he never got sick, when he died, the father raised him from the dead. To my knowledge, there's no record that he ever caught a cold. And yet he attended service regularly. I said, what's up with some of you? Amen. Jesus attended service regularly. The text says, and he entered again into the synagogue. <laughs> the synagogue was the place where the word of God was read regularly. And if Christ was faithful in attending the synagogue, shouldn't we be faithful in attending the church, which is the institution that Christ uh, set up for us? He said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Bible says, not forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together. Uh, I was somewhere not long ago, and uh, a, a, a bishop was doing a teaching on balance. And, the, and, and surely enough, you get enough religious, you get the religious uh, people together, and they start, when they start talking about balance, the first culprit is church. And we, got to, we have too many services, and we do this and doing that. So after, he, and he did a, real, a rather nice presentation. So I raised my hand being me, I said, well, I would like to know about some of the other things that steal our time. And he said to me, well, give me an example. I said, golf. Recreation. There are, there are, there are many things that steal our time, that gets us out of the house. Why is it that when we start talking about balance, the first thing we cut it's time with God. That's a trick of Satan. That's a trick of Satan. You know, we're in a day now where parents uh, can't, the kids can't attend a weeknight service for a whole year, a whole semester, uh, because they're in school. And they got to get that homework. But parents, you did good. You, you have a good job. You're making all the money. Faring well. Got your kids in nice schools, some nice public, some nice private. You're doing good. Yeah. And, uh, and your mother and your father took you to church. Sometimes you did your homework on the back row. <laughs> Fell asleep in church. Now they are too precious. Oh, the little precious darlings. Don't raise little devils now. Because, see, whereas we take them out of church, we hand them the devil. We, we, we give them the devil, and we don't even watch them. So there they are with that iPhone. Everything in the world is in their hand. Everything. And in many cases, we don't, we don't even check to see what they're looking at. And, and these marketers, I talk about it, but you won't hardly say amen. They know the power of images. 
They know how to closely link the titles to the porn website, to the title of a children's website. Just one uh, misspelling, just maybe the same word, but spelled a different way. And all little Johnny got to do uh, one time is pull up that image. And it is indelibly planted in his mind. Or little Susie. And there they are with the seeds planted while you are arguing with the preacher saying church lasts too long. Not knowing that Satan have planted a seed in your child. Then it begins to manifest years later. You wonder where it came from. I tell you where it came from. The devil got you with misdirections. He had you looking in places where you shouldn't have been looking. And where you should have been looking, you weren't looking. And he slipped in, the Bible says, unaware. He came in under the radar. While you were on the, the less have less church committee. <laughs> Satan sold diabolical, sold a diabolical image into, into the mind of your child. I got to move on from this. But Jesus attended church. That day at the synagogue on the Sabbath, Saturday, not only was Jesus there, but also in attendance, and they were in Capernaum. He had not really started his Galilean ministry at this point. Also there at the synagogue in Capernaum, we find that there was a nameless man in attendance who had a physical condition. First thing I want to say about this man is that he's to be commended. He did not allow his physical condition his physical handicap to keep him from the worship service. We invent reasons to miss church. This man persevered. The Bible tells us what his handicap was. The Bible says that he had a withered hand, which literally means that the hand was shriveled up. The hand was Paralyzed, He suffered some paralysis in one of his hands. We're not told whether it is the right hand or the left. And with this paralysis in that hand, notice it wasn't paralysis in his arm. It was a paralysis in his hand. But the paralysis in his hand made that hand useless. And among the things it meant was he could not earn a living. He couldn't get work. Amen. There was no welfare in those days. They didn't have the social safety nets that we have today. And so he was in a bad place. Also, the fact that his hand was withered or shriveled indicates that the problem was not congenial to it was, it was not messed up from birth, but rather the result of some accident or some disease. So the man suffered a trauma, and the trauma left him with a hand that would not work. So the man went to service, and Jesus went to the service. All right, are you following me? And not only was the man there and Jesus there, but we also learn in verse 2, it says, and they watched him. The they uh, who were also in attendance was the religious leaders of the day called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the highest court of justice and the Supreme Council in ancient Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin was 
there. Matthew's gospel chapter 12 and verse 14 calls them the Pharisees. Luke's gospel chapter 6 and verse 7 tells us that they were scribes and Pharisees. They were the Sanhedrin. I want to say this. Let me digress it for a minute. Disobedience is never a good thing. Never. Several conflicts that Jesus had with the Sanhedrin, with the scribes and the Pharisees, that absorbed so much of his time and energy uh, happened to him, uh, brother preachers, because of a disobedient leper whom the Lord had healed and told the man, don't tell nobody. We admire that man for telling it, but the man created a major problem. The Bible says in Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verse 43 through 45, after Jesus healed him, the Bible says in verse 43, and he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away, and said unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way. Show thyself to the priest. Offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testament unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter. Insomuch, look at this, that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city but was without in desert places and they came to him from every quarter. See, to speak up when the Lord tells us to be quiet is not good. Well, I just couldn't keep it to myself. Yes, you can. I'm so happy that I can't, I can't even sit down in service. The Holy Ghost is moving on me. Yes, you can. I say it's time for the word of the Lord. Bring it in. Okay, okay. I heard you shout. All right, because we're moving on, and the, and the spirit is subject to the prophet. Praise the Lord. I've been in services where people uh, begin to act uh, in, uh, uncontrollably and, and behave any kind of way. You can't do that in a service. So uh, the man calls the problem. And if you read, uh, you see in Mark chapter 2 and verse 6, uh, verse 16 of chapter 2, verse 18 of chapter 2, and verse 24, what Jesus uh, uh, had to deal with the Pharisees, with the Sanhedrin, because the word got out too soon. He was going to let the, he was going to put the word out, but uh, when the time was right. But this guy opened his mouth, and so now we see our Lord spending huge amounts of time with them. And they were there to see this particular day in the synagogue whether Jesus would heal that man. Now what is clear in our text is that these religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, cared nothing for this man. He was expendable. They were fueled by their fear and their hatred of Jesus Christ. All they wanted to do was stop him. And they didn't care who they destroyed in the process. They just were bent on stopping Jesus. And so now we see the setting. Jesus is in the service. A man with a withered hand who's ready to be healed is in the service. And on the front row, there are, there's the Sanhedrin. They have a choice seats in the service. Can I get a witness? And um, what I love about Jesus, you know, we talk about how loving Jesus is, and he is. And we're talking about how sweet Jesus is, and he is. But I don't think enough is said about uh, the toughness of Jesus, the courage of Jesus. See, Jesus is my savior, but Jesus is my hero, for he is the most remarkable 
God man. He's the only God man. He's the most remarkable person that I've ever read about. His courage was unsurpassed. We talk about people who gave their lives. Uh, uh, many people lost their lives. They didn't know they were, that they were going to get killed. Uh, they hoped that they would not. Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem. And they're going to kill me when I get there. And he went anyway. Strong. Peter, big burly Peter, drowning on the sea. Jesus reaches up and picks him up in his arms. That little picture of this little Michael Jackson looking sissy that you see on the cross, that is a weak, effeminate artist's opinion. Most artists, you can pretty much tell what the artist looked like by his or her drawing. Jesus was no punk. Jesus was no softy. He grew up, his dad was a carpenter. Carpenters in biblical days were more like lumberjacks. So he was very strong. He never put anything in his body that he shouldn't have. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, nobody, he was so powerful that no one ever died in his presence. Praise the Lord. Jesus is my hero. Uh, he's the original Superman. And uh, the difference between him and the Hollywood Superman is there's no kryptonite. There's nothing, nothing that can stop Jesus. Death couldn't hold him. Praise the Lord. The only reason, the only reason, the only reason death killed him, the Bible tells us, said he looked at death and said, okay, I'll go along with you. The Bible says he became obedient unto death. And then when he died, he died on the cross, but the crucifixion did not kill him. The Bible teaches that he died a supernatural death. The Bible says that he did something that none of us can do. The Bible says he gave up the ghost. He just, at a certain point, he says, I'm going to die now. Three days later, I'm back. What a mighty God we serve. Jesus, in that setting, I'm glad that he's not like most that we see today. Because most of us today, oh, the preachers are so weak. And they call the, the, the preachers who have confidence, they call us arrogant. We're not arrogant. We just, we just know what we believe. They call us mean. They call us judgmental. They call us hard. And had it been 2019, the average Church of God in Christ preacher, average Baptist preacher, average Methodist preacher, most of them, average word of faith would have, you know what they would have done? They would have, uh, with the Sanhedrin and everything, except the way I just showed you, they would have talked about something else. They would have pretended not to notice. Oh, they would have found a softer subject. Because, you know, you got the, you got the skin, to, you got to catch the fish before you're skinning. And you don't want to run people off. And you don't want to be too hard. So some things you, you don't need to talk about. Just, just preach something, make them happy, and go home. Not Jesus. With everything being set, the Bible says the first thing that he does is he looks at the man with the withered hand and says, stand up. Right there, Jesus throws down the gauntlet. No, he didn't go that. Yes, he did. Before I, Jesus said, before I preach, before I read from the Old Testament, before, before we do anything, let's deal with this. Oh, where are the Jesus preachers today who refuse to deal with the real issues? Watch them on the, these networks. Listen to them all day long. They preach fluff. They preach nothing. They preach soft stuff. They, they, won't, they won't go there. Jesus went there. Amen. There the Pharisees, either through chance or perhaps through a pharisaic, pharisaical plot, tries to trap Jesus. 
I don't know, maybe they had that man there. But anyway, he was there. And you know what Jesus does? Jesus comes to his Rubicon. Yes, uh, uh, Napoleon uh, crossed the Rubicon back in uh, 49 B.C., that little river in Italy. By crossing it, he declared war on Pompeii. You know, uh, let me tell you something. There comes a time when the saint has to cross the Rubicon. You have to decide what you're going to do. Whose side you on. That's why I tried to tell you earlier, so everything is plain. It's mighty nice to be on the Lord's side. See, many of us are Christians until we come up to the Rubicon. Oh, I'll serve him, but I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to let him talk about me uh, uh, up to a point. Jesus said, no, no, we're going to deal with this, and we're going to deal with this now. We're going to deal with this first. They don't want us to deal with anything now. The devil is a liar. Praise the Lord. Will he cross his Rubicon? All eyes was riveted on Jesus especially the Sanhedrin who was sitting on the front row. What is he going to do? No, he didn't. No, he didn't tell that man to stand up. What will he do? What will he do? We got it now because it's the Sabbath. And I hope, let him try to heal him. Let him do something. Oh, we got it now. See, we, we knew if we would just hold on, he'd kill himself. Oh, yeah, he'd been healing Walking around here, most of the people now follow him instead of following us. They like him better than they like us. He's done some things we can't do. And calling himself the son of God, making himself God. We got him now. And there's that man standing there with a withered hand. And there's my Savior, my Lord and your God, large and in charge. And he says with a voice, John called it, of many waters, stand up. The man with the withered hand stands up, comes down, and stands with Jesus. Let's look at the wisdom of Jesus. The man's healing comes first. Amen. Even though the healing is destined to provoke a showdown. See, let's see, the devil has tried to frighten us because he knows, uh, well, don't say anything. Well, I, get I, I get so tired of being say, told that. I mean, at some point, just why do they tell you so much? Don't say anything. Then what's the point? Say, well, you can't say anything because if you say something, you're going you're gonna to get in trouble with this one. Uh, okay, so you notice that every level you get on, you get told the same thing. Don't say anything. Well, if on every level you're constantly told not to say anything and you're a preacher, then what's the point? Because preachers are supposed to say something. I'm not a librarian. I'm a preacher. Preachers say something. But all you get to, don't bother this and don't bother that and don't preach against this and don't preach against that. You don't want to offend this. We don't want to offend that. After a while, if you listen to these people, you can't preach. You can't preach. You got to go find one little scripture. Today, I want to preach Jesus well. He cried, y'all, and that's the end of that. And then you may have someone in the audience who are crying. Now they're upset because they, they, they think you were thrown off on them. You can't preach. Yes, Jesus sets the stage. And then he asks two separate questions. Questions that would render his enemies speechless. The first question uh, was going to their law. Is it lawful? I can hear him now with the man standing there and the Sanhedrin on the front row. Mad with all of that phylacteries on, got all of their religious garb. You know, the Pharisees love to hang around widows' houses. Oh, they're the men. Jesus says, I got a question for you. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days uh, or to do evil? Yes, the first question asks uh, that mercy takes precedence over their Sabbath law. Here's the question. Here's what he's saying. 
Here is a man. This is what they understood him to be saying. Here is a man in need. If I fail to heal him, though it is the Sabbath day, am I not doing evil? Because he's in need. Amen. There is no wick. There's no welfare. There's no government program. This man needs a job. Nobody's going to hire him. And I know it's the Sabbath, but he's here. And I'm here. And I have healing in my hand. And uh, is it, wouldn't I be doing evil? If I fail to heal him, even though the day is the Sabbath, should not, should mercy win out, even on the Sabbath, which was his point. Shouldn't mercy, now we're in the house of God. Shouldn't mercy win out on the Sabbath. Can I get a witness? And the second question was, uh, do, am I supposed to do this? And the second question is, uh, is it lawful for me to, am I to save life or to kill on the Sabbath? See, if I leave him alone, I'm killing him. He's going to die. He can't work. If I heal him, I'm saving him. So on the Sabbath, uh, should I heal should I kill or should I save life? Are you with me? The question was a doubled edge soul. Doubled edge question. If they have no mercy for saving life, they indict themselves as killers on the Sabbath. The Bible said, verse 4, the sea clause, but they hail their peace. Uh-huh. If they had said no to the question, they would have revealed their cruel hearts before the people who obviously were sympathetic to the man's needs. He couldn't get a job. The people's heart went out to him. And if they said, yes, you should heal them, then their own Sabbath rules that they made up, they went further than God intended, would have uh, been violated. And I'll tell you something else, that they just couldn't have happened. They just, you just can't let this happen. Oh, no. They would have lost the argument and lost uh, future reasons to try to pursue Jesus. And, you know, these religious leaders, they can't be wrong. They can't be wrong. No, we cannot. It's too big a price to pay for us to lose this argument. So they said nothing. Nothing like most preachers today. Yeah, they, they say nothing or they find something else to talk about. But the issue at hand was not financial blessing. The issue at hand was not whether or not you needed God to give you a new car. The issue at hand was this man with a withered hand. What do you do about the man? Now, 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 Clinton started it, Obama continued it, and President Trump said it the other day. The issue at hand is whether or not June should be LGBT Pride Month. Should now I know across the across the body of Christ, many churches are saying nothing. But should we on, say nothing as a declaration is made that takes the month that God created and dedicate it to wickedness? Say it's Pride Month. Pride month, pride, pride.
proud to be a lesbian, proud to be a homosexual, pride, pride month, pride to, proud to be transgender. Ain't know what preachers are finding? They're finding something else to preach about. But I got your pride. Here's what the Bible says about pride. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, Proverbs 16 and 18, pride goeth before destruction. That's, that's what we need to say about pride. See, that, there it is right there, pride. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going to not say anything. While the government uh, declares uh, that the month of June going to give June to perversion. No, that's the issue at hand. This is the man in the, in the synagogue. Now, the, now Trump uh, uh, made the same proclamation, but now, now the media and everybody, I don't know why they don't put these things here equal, is mad uh, at him. And here's why they're upset with the president. For eight years, when Obama had it, during the month of June, President Obama allowed the homosexual flags take down old glory or in addition to old glory in our embassies around the world for the month of June, he let them fly that ungodly uh, flag. Uh, not that the rainbow is ungodly. God made the rainbow. You see, that? You see we got, I got it hanging up there. But they have tried to commandeer it. And they use a different set of colors and numbers of colors. But the, they, they wanted to fly the flag at our embassies. Thank God President Trump said no. Give him a big hand for that. Thank God he said no. You're not going to fly a flag like this, praise the Lord, around the country, around the world, uh, uh, making America seem like that America has been, has become Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, it's much easier to say nothing. It's much easier, you like it better, if I preach the nice little Father's Day message to you and send you home packing. But, but I'm just like Jesus. Jesus said to the man, stand up. Get up, get up. He threw down the gauntlet. He said, it's time to deal with this stuff. Here we are in a world. Well, I don't know where these national, na national preachers are. You ought to, somebody go find them. In a world where men are pretending to be women and women men. In a world where murder is everywhere. In Brazil, a lesbian couple uh, killed, uh, their uh, lady killed her nine-year-old son. She cut off his penis and cut off his head because he reminded her of his daddy. Guess when she went lesbian, they didn't need dad and, and, and brutally killed that boy. This is a wicked world. And uh, it will only grow more wicked unless we say something. <laughs> Hallelujah. The devil is a liar. More and more of our preachers and singers and entertainers now are embracing Carlton Pearson. Going for that universalism. Oh, we're still killing babies in the womb. Hallelujah. And it's amazing to me. Preachers who claim not to know about it. Now you know everything else. You know every scripture in the Bible about giving. You know all of the verses about raising money. But how is it that you can know all about that stuff? But we don't seem to know about issues of morality. Issues of right and wrong. And we're paying a dear price because look at our community. Y'all don't like me when I preach about this. But look at our community. Look at what our young men look like. Crazy colors in your hair. My God, where's your daddy? Pants hanging off your behind. Acting like a fool. 
Oh God, you don't seem to understand that the life is not filled with constant do-overs. There come a time when you got to grow up and you got to get it right. And I know, I know there are people who say, Preacher, you shouldn't say those kinds of things because you'll run them off. Well, praise the Lord, whether you run them off or not, if they go somewhere else and they don't hear the truth, they're still not going to improve anyhow. The only thing that's going to set you free is the truth of God. The Bible says, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Jesus had that man to stand up. Good God Almighty. And the people didn't say a word. And Mark tells me that Jesus looked at him eyeball to eyeball. He went from one member of the Sanhedrin to the other. And he was looking in their eyes. That's what Mark means when he says in verse 5, And when he had looked round about on them. That is, he went to every one of those members of the Sanhedrin. Said, I've asked you a question. Looking them in their face and said, answer me. And they said, they wouldn't say a word. Answer me. They wouldn't say a word. And guess what happened when they wouldn't say a word? Anger rose up in the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. He, he got angry. It irritated him. It perturbed him. Sometimes people want to know, the preacher, sometimes when you preach, you, you, you preach like you're angry. Well, I am. It angers me to see our baby slaughtered in the womb. It angers me to see our boys become sissies. It angers me to see our girls become lesbians. It angers me to see our marriages fail. It angers me to see our sons. Every time you turn on News Channel 14, there it is, a big parade of brothers killing brothers, brothers shooting brothers. People, we're breaking in each other's houses. We're doing all kinds of crazy things. And then when you go to the church, the preacher get up and try to preach and blame it on society. We blame it on everyone else. We pretend that we're not born with brains. We pretend that we can't come up to a high standard. Yes, it perturbs me because we can do better. It was, it perturbed Jesus and it perturbed me. Good God Almighty, the thing that made, hallelujah, for Nahas, such a man of God, is that he was zealous for the Lord. That is, he felt what God felt. What made God angry, made him angry. We're living in a day now where too many of us are being entertained by the very thing that make God mad. But I wonder today, I got a question for you. I got a question for you. The question is simply this. Who is on the Lord's side? Oh Lord, who don't mind standing up like Jesus did and declare Good God Almighty, that the Bible is right, that Jesus is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords, and he's able. Ah, he's able. Yes, he is. Somebody praise the Lord. Somebody praise him in the sanctuary. done Jesus the Bible said he got angry I know we want to call him meek and lowly humble and holy and he's all of that but that ain't all he is when he went into the temple and he saw how they turned the temple into a den of thieves Jesus sweet Jesus kind Jesus got upset 
turned over the tables of the money changers, ran them out of the temple, and there were temple guards standing right there. Not one of them moved because they knew that they can't do anything with this mighty man because this is God, hallelujah, in the flesh. Well, it's time for those of us who are filled with the Holy Ghost, it's time to rise up and speak for the Lord. Oh, it's time. Oh, oh, it's time, it's time. Somebody magnify him. Somebody magnify him right now. Jesus. Jesus, the Bible said he went from being angry, anger ignited in his eyes. He went from rage, anger, anger, to the Bible says, and he became greed. Full gambit of emotions. You see the text? Angry, but greed because of the hardness of their heart. When he looked at them, he saw, even though they were religious men, there's nothing there. What was that lady name at the first time? That's, uh, that, uh, we, we were at a, yes, Gianna Jensen. We were at the press conference the other day. I saw it. Gianna Jensen, young white lady, Fireball for Jesus. She survived an abortion. Left her with uh, cerebral palsy. When we were uh, in the speaker's office, she asked me and John. She said, would you guys be so kind as to hold me up? Let me, would you flank me? One on my right and one on my left as I make my declaration. We both said we consider it an honor. We went in there, and there we stood. I was on her left hand, my son-in-law on the right hand. She's in the middle. A little frail, fireball. Appeared to be maybe 5'2", five 5'3". Five fireball for Jesus. We could feel her as we held her up. As she talked, we could feel when she put a little more pressure mm -hmm. on the arms to help brace herself. Yes, but she gave it all she had. Then she said something that got me. She said, where is your compassion? Mm. And I looked at the media. No emotion. No compassion. Now, had that been Planned Parenthood, they would have been cheering them on. Right. All of them, all of them. They would have been cheering her on had she been speaking for abortion. That woman stood there having survived it with cerebral palsy, giving herself to it. And she said to them, where is your compassion? And they sat there, every one of them. You see them on the news, all of them. Stone faced. Now I know, spare me your journalism talk. Well, a journalist is not supposed to uh, be moved. They've been gave, giving that up. They've been giving it. All the journalists now, because I've dealt with the media, I know. If your story don't meet, don't fit their narrative, they won't report on you. Now I know. They were stone hard. And then she said something that really made them cringe. She brought up somebody that I guess that she shouldn't have brought up. She mentioned Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. A conspiracy of silence. They were totally unmoved. When Jesus saw the hardness of their heart. He felt sorry for them because he knew all of them going to hell. All of them. 
Religious leaders. But you know what? There was no time for tears. So, no time. I'd like to catch myself just to see because that was still an issue at hand. That, 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 there's a man standing there with a withered hand. Yes, sir. So Jesus, after getting angry, and then after being grieved, turned away from the Sanhedrin and looked at that man and said, stretch forth thine hand. That man, realizing, I know the Sanhedrin can't help me. I know they can't help me. That man obeyed and stretched out his hand. And as he obeyed, his hand was made whole just like the other. And guess what Jesus did? He outsmarted him. He didn't violate one Sabbath law. For there is no work involved in saying, stretch out your hand. There is, and the man was left innocent, for there is no Sabbath law against obeying someone who tells you to stretch out your hand. So he healed the man without violating any of their laws. And they knew he got them. And yes. you know what? Even with the healing, I saw on the news that evening, back to the lady, one of the reporters reported this. They called her name. And if I could have gotten to him, I, I, I would have had words with him. I, I would have had words with, with him. If I ever get a chance to say I'm going to have words with him. Uh, so and so, Elaine, uh, what was her name? Uh, this was wonderful lady said she she claimed to have survived an abortion. Something some, something just got went all over me. She claimed she claimed that, that's, that's the way they reported. She claimed one of those guys one of those guys who claimed to have the lady the late the lady showed on her birth certificate. It says, I survived an abortion. Ain't no claim. She has evidence. But, but uh, that's why I told you immediately, they, they're not right. So, so you, know, you know what the Pharisees, you know what they did? When Jesus healed the man, they were still unmoved. Still unmoved. Guess what they did? They violated all the rules. Jumped up and ran out of the synagogue. Now, when they ran, let me tell, can I tell y'all, I'm about done. Can I tell you where they went? So you can't, you can't hoop this. Let me tell you where they went. They went to their, now, you know, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, they would have it out. But there was another group that none of them cared for. See, and that was a group called the Herodians. The Herodians were Jews. They were Hellenized Jews. Greek-speaking Jews, Jews given to Greek culture. The Sanhedrin resisted greatly Hellenization, for they viewed it as a threat to Judaism. So the Hebraic Sanhedrin hated the Hellenized Herodians whose lone function, they were viewed as traitors of their own people, was to support Herod. No matter what Herod did, and this was Herod Antipas, a wicked man there ever been one. So, so uh, they they hated the Herodians, but they went to the Herodians of all people to take counsel on how they could kill Jesus. Now, view this: those whom God had made specialists for salvation, the Sanhedrin, went to those whom Caesar had made specialists, specialists for death. It reminds me of the preachers today who support political parties that support abortion. It's a, it reminds me of preachers today who claim to be preachers of the Bible, but they endorse same-sex marriage. 
It reminds me of preachers today who supposed to carry the word of the Lord, but they, they think that a person should be fed whether they work or not, even though this book says, if a man don't work, neither shall he eat. It reminds me of people today who have abandoned all of their Christian beliefs to partner up with certain political parties. Well, pre right. preacher, what part is you? Neither. I am a, a registered non-affiliate. So, I, you know, I always tell that. But look at how many preachers today have sold their souls. And here's how you know they sold their souls on what they were silent about. Silent during the Obama years. Silent on these issues now. And they are trying to create a new morality. Today, the new, what's immoral today, it is no longer immoral today to be a homosexual. What's immoral is to preach against homosexuality. It is not immoral today in the eyes of many for a man to be transgendered. What's immoral is for you to disagree with transgenderism. Oh yeah, preach wouldn't. It is, it is not considered to be immoral to kill a baby in the womb or to kill one that's just born. What's immoral and judgmental is to speak out against it. These guys have linked up with the Herodians. They're Herodians. It doesn't matter to me what organization they're part of. It, 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 it doesn't matter. The spirit, the spirit, the spirit of it. You can be Church of God in Christ, Baptist, Free Will Baptist, Missionary Baptist, AME Zion, uh, uh, United Method, you name it. Uh, Church of Christ, praise the Lord, Free Will Baptist, No Will Baptist, whatever. Doesn't matter. It's a spirit. And if you notice this, anytime, anytime church, the church links up with the government. You won't like me now then both entities fail to do their jobs. See, because when the church links up with government, government has its own God. And the church who links up with government has to sacrifice its God for the God that the government has. Right, 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 right. Well, the government's God is government. Their God is them. So they say to get our dollars, you can't preach this or you can't preach that. I told you about what uh, Hopper Collins is, is, is trying to do with the Bible. The lady, let me tell you all this, the lady whose husband Wrote the law for the marriage amendment. I saw her a couple weeks ago. Beautiful lady. She said to me, Bishop Wooden, it's so good to see you. I said, yes, ma'am. said, do you know who I am? I said, yes, ma'am. I know who you are. She's a heroine. She's special. I just love her. So gave me a big hug. She treated me like I was her grandson. Amen. Just sweet lady. She said, I'm having trouble getting my book published. I've gone to the major publishers. She mentioned Zandam and others. Said they won't publish my book because they have problems with some things that I won't include it and things that were said. And she said, and Reverend Bishop, they have problems with what you said. And she said, but I will not change it because that's what happened. <laughs> now, when I think back on what I said during that time, is I said that two men do not equal one mother and two women do not equal one father. Is that not, has that now become controversy? What I said then was that the definition of marriage is older than the United States of America. I talked about how the first continental 
Congress, if I'm saying it correctly, among the first two uh, laws that they established was the, de the definition of marriage, and it was then uh, between a man and a woman. I talked about how all of the world religions recognize marriage as a union between a man and a woman. I said that when God created the institution of marriage, God did not ask our opinion. He didn't ask us what we think. God could have made uh, three Eves for one Adam. He didn't. He could have made 20 Eves for one Adam and called that a marriage. He didn't. He could have made three Adams uh, for four Eves. He didn't. He could have made Adam, and he could have made Steve, and he didn't. He made Adam and Eve. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. Vicki, I, I went back to what I said during that time. Now those things are too controversial for ma major publishing companies to publish. It's the conspiracy to silence the gospel. To silence the preacher. They've sent you hints. We don't care what you believe. Have your beliefs, but you better not say it. Think what you may, but you better not utter it. We were talking to your brother, and he was this when he was living in San Francisco. He didn't, he didn't, he hadn't gotten the memo yet. Just got him a job. He's in San Francisco. Work, doing, doing real good work. And they were just talking one day in the office. And he almost, he, he said he framed his lips to disagree with them on the issue out there of who can marry. He said everybody in the department grew silent and looked right at him and dared him to say, I know you're not getting ready to say, you agree with the Bible. It's in the workplace. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a move afoot to silence the believer. But you know what? We will not be silenced. Amen. Because our God, he's the one who healed that man. And, and you know what? When he healed that man that day, uh, he didn't put the unbelievers out. He didn't put the doubters out. See, Jesus ain't got to put the doubters out to heal. He can heal any kind of way he wants to. Amen. He's our Savior. And if we stand for him, he will stand for us. I don't want the Lord to be angry with me. And the way to avoid that is to serve him. And to serve him with great delight. She's doing so much better now, but I got word that it wasn't looking good at one point for my mother. God turned it around. But, but, hold, hold, hold that. I told the Lord, though, during that time, tears me done to my chin. Lord, you're just good. And I'm going to serve you no matter what. If you're going to take a loved one of mine to heaven, you're still God. And you're still good. All of that. Still wonderful. Lord, I believe you, but I trust you. I believe you for what I'm asking you for, but I trust you with the outcome. That's where you got to be. That's where you got to be. See, he can't just be God when he's saying what you want him to say. And then all of a sudden, something goes a little soft. Now you don't have a praise. Well, well I'm grieving. You still ought to be able to lift your hand. Still ought to be able to lift them. You, might, you may not be happy. You may not be in a good mood. But you don't have to be in a good mood to say hallelujah. The song says, my hallelujahs 
belong to you. The truth is all hallelujahs belong to God. Because there's nothing else you can do with hallelujah. If you look at the devil and say hallelujah, that doesn't apply to him. Hallelujah only applies to the Lord. Lift your hands and tell him hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We seek to, pre to please you, Lord. We don't want you to be perturbed at us. We seek to please you. I want to have a different kind of prayer and I'm done. I want to pray for those who, I want to pray for those today. I'm, I'm, I admit I'm flipping the script. I want, to, I want to pray for those today whose greatest need, greatest desire is to please the Lord. I want to please you, Lord. I mean, I, I got things in my life that I need you to fix and to work on, but first things first. Amen. I want to please you. Um, where's the Thomases? Ben Thomas? Is Brother Ben here? He's in the choir. Where is he? Where's Brother Thomas? Brother Thomas, I want you to know that you and uh, your wife and your son and your daughter you all been a, your inspiration. Thank you, sir. Because I found myself saying what Thomas is saying. Hallelujah. I want to honor God. Amen. Do I have anybody want to honor God? Amen. Amen. Well, no matter what, what your situation is, do you want to honor the Lord? Praise the Lord. Lift your hands and give him honor. Give him honor. Give him honor. Give him honor. Glory to God. Oh, he's a healer. He's a way maker. He's a company keeper in a lonely hour. But I, we know who and what he is. Who are we going to be to him? He's looking for some people who will be faithful to him. Do you not know that we serve a God who has a heart? The Bible teaches that he can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. I don't want to break God's heart. Lord, we praise you. I'm getting ready to pray. Lord, we praise you. Mm, we praise you. We praise you, Lord, we praise you, we do, we do, uh, Lord, we praise you, Lord, we you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. 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 Make us more like your Lord. Make us like you, Lord. Oh, God, we come before you today. We come before you. We don't want to be like the Sanhedrin. Oh, God, they cared nothing for that man. They cared nothing for that man. They only cared for their agenda. They only cared for their agenda. God, we want your agenda. We want the agenda of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We come before you today. We come before you right now. Yes, we have needs. Yes, we need help, Lord. 
Yes, we need you to move on our behalf. But God, we put all those things in a secondary place. We put those things on a lower level. And God, on the highest level, we come before you and we ask you, oh Lord, to give us to please you. In the name of Jesus, oh God, we found out that the Bible says, if a man's ways please the Lord, makes his enemies be at peace with him. Hallelujah. If God be pleased with us, he will give us this land. Oh, oh Lord, touch us, Jesus. Touch us right now, Lord. Touch us, Jesus. Take away everything that's not like it today. On this Father's Day, in this Jesus Pride Month, oh God, take away everything that's not like you, Jesus. Save the lost. Save the lost. Oh, God, heal the sick. God, destroy every yoke in the name of Jesus. God, search our souls. Search us right now. Take away everything that's not like you, Lord. Take away envy. Take away strife. Take away self-righteousness. God, we lay our arrogance on the altar in the name of Jesus. We humble ourselves before you. In the name of the Lord, God touch our morals, God touch our mind, God touch our lifestyles, help us to live in a way that you be pleased with. In the name of Jesus, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, even those who are streaming out there, touch them right now, touch right now, touch their souls, touch their souls, Lord. Let them be in health and prosper, even as their souls prosper. In the name of Jesus. Oh, you're able. You're able. You're able, Lord. Hallelujah. You're able to touch our minds, to touch our souls, to touch our hearts. In the name of Jesus. And God, while you're touching us, Fill us again with the Holy Ghost. God, why are you touching us? Touch right now. God, let the Holy Ghost move all over us. God, let your spirit move from heart to heart and from breast to breast in the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, do it in our souls. Do it in our minds. Oh, Lord, Lord, prepare us for whatever lie ahead. God, make us ready for whatever lie ahead. Jesus, we trust you. Jesus, we believe you. Jesus, we love you. Oh, ah, ah, Lord, oh, Lord. Lord Jesus, we bring our shortcomings to you. We bring, hallelujah, our infirmities to you. God, touch, touch my mother. God, touch, touch Elder Barrio's mother. God, touch, touch Evangelist White. Lord, touch those whose name I don't know to call Lord, oh, oh Lord, heal in the room, heal in the room. We rebuke the devil, we rebuke death, we rebuke sickness in the name of the Lord. Oh, oh have your way, have your way, have your way, have your way. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. 
thy will be done. Don't ask the Lord, tell the Lord, your will be done. I know what I want, but thy will be done. I know what I desire, but your will be done. In the name of Jesus. The Lord is strengthening right now. I heard the Holy Ghost say, tell him, I'm strengthening right now. Receive it, receive it, receive it. Receive the Lord's strengthening. Receive the Lord's strengthening. He makes his angels ministering spirits. We have an angel who sits before the Lord on our behalf. I see angels ascending and descending. Good God Almighty, bringing strength from heaven and putting it on you. Good God Almighty, giving you the ability to rise above. Giving you the courage and the strength that you need. Drying up conditions. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 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 And Father, before we close this, we pray for the pride community. The destruction that goeth before pride. We pray that you save them before the destruction. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that yokes be destroyed. We pray that for those who are in the pride community, whose heart is not as hard as those Sanhedrin's were, we pray that you would save them. We pray that you would turn them. We, we, we thank you, Lord, for the 200 or so men and women who gathered in Washington, D.C. just a few weeks ago. All of them ex-pride members. All of them delivered. It, it, it didn't, Lord, it didn't fit the narrative of ABC, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, CNN, and all of them. It didn't fit that narrative, so they wouldn't cover it. Because they claim that these people do not exist. They claim that you're not a deliverer. Well, God, we know that there is no sin that you can't deliver someone from. And we've all been saved from our sins. Whether it was this sin or any other sin, we were on our way to hell and you saved us. So we pray for the pride. We pray for the pride. God save. God save the pride community. And I know that there are those in the community who scoff and who say that they do not need saving. And Lord, we pray for them. But then there are many in that lifestyle who readily are crying out, even now, even now, saying, Lord, take this away from me. Lord, remove this desire. God, get me out of this. Oh, God, help me. Lord, we pray for them. We pray that not a one be lost. We pray that not a one be lost. In the name of Jesus. And not just for this community. But God, there is no adultery pride community. There is no fornication pride community. Nobody's waving banners. There, there is no thief pride community. Oh God. But in this. Men 
have made their glory their shame. We ask for deliverance. And we declare this month, Jesus Christ. We declare strength to the believers. We declare yokes broken in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.